without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Jeff Murray. You got to see him up on the big stage this morning, talking a little bit about MetLife's transformation, what they've done with Docker, um, and this will be a little bit uh, of a deeper dive on that. So Jeff has done some some other uh, DockerCon presentations. He was in Austin this year and did sort of the how, how MetLife got started. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go back and watch the video on that. This will be the continuation of that. So where MetLife has gone from their first projects and how they're expanding their Docker use cases uh, across the environment. So Jeff, take it away. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. So welcome to this use case talk. Um, it's really meant to be an extension of what was on the stage, the keynote, and also what you heard back in Austin. So really um, do want to give, uh, I guess, a shout out to the previous DockerCon um, in Austin as much as I can. There was a lot of work that went into that, and uh, that project kind of set us on a path. Um, but we're also looking at where we're going now. So thanks for stopping by. Um, I, I hope this is really crammed full of a lot of really good information for how to get started as well as how to, um, to take this thing to a modernization track. So here's the things I'm hoping to go over. Um, I'll give you another spiel on MetLife, you know, who we are. Um, that new digital requirement solution that required us to think really differently about how we deploy things, so understanding what a Docker container was from way back. <clears throat> and then how we took that and then started looking at things that would allow us to talk, talk about extreme value and then uh, forward looking all the way up into the future. So um, MetLife. Um, it goes without saying that we've, 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 we're a large company. We, uh, we operate in regions around the world. We have tons and tons of policyholders. Uh, it's important to us to understand that, that our brand is changing as well. And one thing that uh, you'll notice uh, if you've been um, following MetLife any time in the recent past, we no longer have Snoopy. Kind of a, that was a tough one. Um, but uh, especially for my son, uh, we really did like the, the stuffed animals. But um, it's a digital change. It's a brand. Uh, marketing is telling us they want a trusted advisor. You know, we don't need to think about the if in life so much as the um, MetLife is with you all the way. So that branding is changing, so the digital strategy is going to follow along with it. You notice that our look and feel is a little bit more streamlined. But we've constantly been doing this. So we've been innovating for a really long time. Since 1868, when we were founded, the, the, the universal stock ticker was the innovation of the day. Back then, we had 1,400 policies, um, and just over uh, 4 million um, of that was, 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 was in force. By 1920s, fast forward, we're doing uh, 1,029 claims per day. That's one claim every 28 seconds. 1950s, the first large-scale UNIVAC came online. By then, we're already at 45 billion in force, covering 33 million people. By the 1980s, that's 300 billion in force, um, and that's when our first consolidated claims app came online. It's, it was still in production as of a few months ago. So it's a, um, that's a big deal. We, we innovated so much and that we had so much legacy to carry on. What that created was over 400 systems of record that we had to deal with in a good way for the long term, but that's, that's a lot of complexity in an ecosystem that's extremely broad. And if we look at that in dollar and cents model, investing in innovation with that type of baggage um, is hard. So historically, we're looking at an IT spend portfolio of around 80% just to maintain and currency-wise. That means that we can only put 20% to innovation and these new disruptive type of projects that would change our landscape. We, did, we, we do have, right now, five deployment models. That's on-prem, in the cloud, across different clouds, and different various operating systems. So we're complex, it's hard, it's a, it's a common theme, though, with big enterprises, and we're not any different just because we're MetLife. So this new digital requirement that came up, you heard us about, um, we were talking about it on the keynote, we've talked about it at DockerCon. So Aaron, our solutions engineer lead, uh, he's an AVP over that, came to the platform engineering team with the architects and we decided that we needed to think about this, this new application differently. We needed to t start talking about this, this, this capability that we had to bring to market that it was a 
global sales and servicing platform. We wanted to normalize how MetLife did business around the world. That was what the developers had in mind. And so we had to figure out, well, how can we as infrastructure engineers and architects deliver for that development community? And that's where standardization, containerization really kind of got a whole lot of traction. So how do we do that? Well, we got together with a small group of developers, architects, engineers, and we had executive sponsorship. And we branded that group the Mod Squad. And this is not easy to do. There's an entire track around transformation. Tim Tyler is, is actually going to be talking about that in a very, very good detail of understanding what that type of dif disruption to an organization does. But we did all that, and that's great. But so how does that help the enterprise and the back end of that? But to understand how we could get to that enterprise, we understand really in depth this container stuff. So we didn't take it to where most companies have in the past and just do a dev int type deployment of containers and stop there and kind of let it marinate for a while. We decided to go all in. This is meant to be an eye chart. It's not um, really, the, the idea here is that this is the business capabilities behind this global sales and servicing platform that was being talked about. The idea was we were going to pragmatically take on these capabilities and sunset other applications over time. That was another way to modernize. But it's extremely complex, and we went all the way to production with it. So I don't want to downplay the fact that it was, it was hard, and it was not something that we took lightly. But the impact on that infrastructure was a very good value proposition for us. If we understand what a container is, really you get rid of that big, huge guest OS. Instead of talking about building infrastructures that have to support tens of gigabytes worth of an OS, you're talking about having to support Ks, kilobytes, or maybe even megabytes of an application and binary library. So the convergence is really important. That does have a big impact on how you deploy and build things. So if we were to build the same thing in a monolithic type of, of um, structure, that would be a web an application, data. You'd have different operating teams for different web technologies, different operating teams for different application technologies. And if you needed more than one application technology, you would have to scale that team out, scale it up, and that would also impact infrastructure. Here, if we look at it from the pack on the other side, we, we see that Node.js and API proxy and web proxy all look the same. They're just, just a container thing that we have to operate. Inside the container is what's different. The claims, application, open enrollment, new business, those capabilities all look the same. They're managed the same. They're developed the same. So we went from GSSP being 264 complex things to build out, 66 services to it just being 264 discrete things we had to put on the infrastructure and manage the same way we would the other things on the infrastructure by Docker. So the existing solutions and in, in, in infrastructure, they create these operational islands. You've got physical knowledge management. You've got physical ways of deployment. You've got virtual ways of deployment. You've got virtual knowledge management, different teams, clouds, shared platforms. All that is different silos of work and how things get done across the organization. Not to mention where they run, whether they're on-prem, in the cloud, that's different teams, different teams, different groups of people. Docker Enterprise gives the opportunity to normalize all that. So if we were to build a container as a service model, that IT management, we can all kind of aggregate around one common strategy and deliver it forward. That was the value proposition. And then the portability really made it more sense to take home. And the fact that now we could build containers, we could build containers to scale, and we could build containers put them into a pipeline and take them around the world to deliver these capabilities for global sales and services normalized around the globe. So that was the project. That was the disruption that got us catapulted into a container strategy long term. But it was just for that business capability. So now, what if we were to value proposition this? Let's take a peek and figure out what containers can really do for that legacy application portfolio. And then we have the MTA story. I can't speak enough around the fact that this also, just like the rapid inception of containerization and orchestration to an enterprise, this program opened our eyes to the other side of how it could be possible if we were to take on the fact of modernizing applications, if it worked. Now, and then that was the big 
$64,000 question. If we can get this done. I'm, I was not totally shocked that it worked. I was surprised how fast it worked. We did have a do not call opt out application. We picked it. It was simple. We wanted to make it simple because we kind of had, I felt we had enough technology now to understand what would be a slam dunk. It was our slam dunk. If we could pull this off, I knew the extrapolation across the infrastructure, it would, it would make waves inside of MetLife and we could start talking about, talking about modernizing a lot more stuff. It took us one day to containerize it, as you heard, and it was one technology. So I'm gonna dive into how we made that decision point and with partnership with Avanade and Microsoft, they'll help with these, choosing out the right, teasing out the right technology that's gonna be able to scale. But if we talk about the architectures, Custom web services and servicing apps. I wouldn't get into a, a vendor type of situation with this. One to end tiers, it can be multi-tiered, but limit the number of technologies in it so you can get the maximum value. It will evolve inside of just one technology. It will get ever more complex because you want to take it from start all the way to finish. Small data sets are best just so you can get functionality. That's the, that's the key because you want to make sure you can get this thing completed. Frameworks, we're looking at .NET, ASP.NET, ASP Classic, things that you know can be containerized. We chose Java because it was a big piece of our portfolio. Authentication, Federation was the way we went. I wouldn't try to put us just into a session state situation with containers just yet. It gets complex. Networking, think about how you're going to manage DNS. We did DNS lookup. Session state, again, nothing around state do you want to try to keep inside this container? It includes authentication as well as any type of variables inside of the actual application. And isolation, guarantee yourself some ability to get back to your system of record or take it with you. If it doesn't need one, even better. So here's how ours kind of worked out. Uh, just about three or four days before everyone showed up on site, we built out the Azure subscription that was gonna house this stuff, spun up the worker nodes, and waited for the team to show up. Once that team showed up, then we build things out and converted, deployed. I'm not adding too much in, but I'm not taking too much out either. That's really the simple idea around it. But what killed all the time spent was picking things through this, this, these characteristics. I would try to be choosy and be right whenever thinking about how you're going to expand on what you're going to do with the MTA program if you take it on. Other things to consider, things that didn't come up until we got actually hands-on keyboard. Um, environmental differences traditionally handled at that deployment time, you want to try to tackle that. Things about containers are they're immutable, so you want to throw them away and you don't want to rebuild them every time you go to a different environment. So things like configurations, things like um, connection strings, um, those kind of things. Either start thinking about if you're going to do Docker secrets or if you're going to have some parameter passing type of mechanism for it. But those things need to be thought out. Start even, maybe take both of them to the MTA and figure out which one works better for you. Break previous convergence practices. What this means is like um, IIS. If you wanted to previously try to get the most bang out of a server dollar, you would probably put one, two, or 200 sites onto a single server. Well, in containers, you just want to target that one application pool. So it's that small. You just want that application. So um, things like a, Wob, a WebSphere application server, a Liberty server, those things, same type of, of idea mindset, but you'll have to take those server XML or web config or any type of, of server config down to the single most common denominator, and that's what you containerize, not a big, large workload. So you'll have to break some of that. That was a, that was a tough thing for some of the engineers that were in the room at the time of we have to basically re-engineer things that you did 10 years ago to make money or how to converge it, you go back to that just one server per container. File-based logging and aggregation. This is important. You're going to put a lot of these little containers out into this infrastructure and they're all going to create logs and tell you what's going on, but they're going to create logs and tell you what's going on where they are. You need to aggregate that back. So something like a Splunk or an Elastic, start figuring that out before we do tackle on the MTA. You'll want to walk in there with some type of strategy, at least thought about so you can investigate. And monitoring. Monitoring your, per, your, your, your current proprietary vendors are going to have a hard time with containers because they're so new. So you'll want to look at something like a Prometheus or some similar that is container native that will be able to give you that type of monitoring around how a service or auto discovery works 
We found that our proprietary vendors weren't quite there yet. We leveraged the features set of Prometheus against that vendor and they had to adopt very rip rapidly. So it, was, it worked very well. So I keep talking about the team. This is what the team was made up of. It was a partnership. So there was Docker, Avanade, Avanade Cloud Engineer. Um, we did have a part-time Microsoft folks that came in, uh, but we had cloud engineer from my side, application specialist, technology specialist, development tool specialist, container specialist. The key is cross-functional. You're really not going to get a whole lot of value if it's just one team that's taking this thing through around the fact that you're going to get that ingrained into your organization well. So executive sponsorship is also a big deal. I would, though, think that cross-functional is probably almost more important because then you can kind of socialize this thing and get everyone involved and understand how their job is going to be impacted in a good way. And we've seen this slide. This was the, uh, this, this was the good the story. U.S. infrastructure reduction forecast was taking that application. We could do easy assessments to figure out exactly how to reduce this cost because with a container, remember, you're expecting to just... CPU and RAM, and if most containers at Linux-based especially, you're looking at 512 megabyte footprint. So you, t you say, I want to have no more than um, 100 on a server, you know exactly how big that server should be. Um, you could build that and then scale that thing very linearly across it. Um, so it becomes a function of just RAM, 512 times X number of containers, that's how big a server needs to be, and the CPU will come along. So with that also, I will say MTA program was very good at the fact that they bring ORI specialists with you to help you build a strong business case internally. Since we were one of the first people down, we helped impact a little bit of that, but they came with exactly what I would want as a leader, my team, to tell me why would we want to go down this path, build the business case. It can't just be about the fact that we want to have Moby stickers. So or hoods, or you know, the, the hippie things that kids are doing nowadays. I don't know, but you get the point. You have to have both. It has to make fiscal sense, especially with a company that is nothing but a financial service agent. And yes, it was only 10% of our portfolio. Um, so when we talk about this, we're talking with our EMEA partners now to do this similar type of technology overhaul and look and feel. Um, it's really simple. We have standards of this, this type of server. So the type of server involved here is a WebSphere application server, and we're targeting a Liberty container. Um, that's a very specific stack, but it's a Java runtime inside of that. Um, the most important reason why WebSphere makes sense is the WebSphere team at MetLife historically is renowned for their st standards. How they build a server is very specific. We're able to then take that to a container very specifically, with this MTA program, it highlighted the fact that, and now through our SDLC, we'll be able to, instead of target a Liberty server, modify a Bamboo job or Alassian stack to point to our container images instead and just run it with a Compose. That's a powerful statement we worked out with the MTA program when they were there was exactly how are we gonna deploy this to scale across a very large footprint of applications. So now we have kind of that model to be able to say, once we get the funding to build this, we'll just click go, and then we can start realizing some of these RI models, which is very powerful. And we can reuse that in our EMEA region, our Asia regions, as we go around the globe. So I really feel passionate about this internally, because to me, it really does resonate with my leadership about the fact that now I know how I can fund some of this stuff. Most of the time, if you're a um, and it, your leadership meeting is, this is a great idea, how are you going to fund it? We can start talking about, I can chip, we can take this technology and reduce this run rate over the next one to two years and then start funding this new innovation next week, or next year, next month. Um, because I've, I've got a way to pay that back now. <clears throat> so Docker Enterprise Edition really is creating a self-funding fuel uh, for our innovation. All right, so roadmap and strategy. Where do we go from here? So we've given you the project that got us involved, given you the business case to say that we should take modernization to the next level. What are we going to do now that we're going to, to take all this stuff on and, and deliver it to scale? Before we do that, we did make some organizational changes post what you saw in DockerCon Austin or that project that, that disrupted the, um, the ability for us to take on containers really quick. But when doing this, it was very 
strategic with leadership to understand we're not going to boil the ocean. We're going to start small and build a model for technologies and integrate that model back into the existing people and processes. That team, which is my team, they create the strategy and build ORI models for strategic technologies that then are able to give back to the existing processes and procedures. That's what we mean by not boiling the ocean. We really want it to be organic growth internally. So then the technology owners that are building servers, they now have a viable container option that if it's done right, should just make sense. So it's not so much of being forced, it's so much of a choice that's capable of them taking on organically. Then you're able to focus on improvement and stability without that people disruption and enable efficiencies and focus on that innovation like you really want to be doing it in a common way, in a common platform. So that's the goal behind the organizational impact. We've seen this, the MetLife platform. The reason that this works well internally for us is that we see developer, operator, and engineer on the deck. They realize where they, where they work. They know that they're part of this, this ecosystem. We've got microservices, traditional, third party. Microservices, net new tech, the guys that are really cutting edge, they're able to work right next to the traditional applications that we want to maintain because they're important to the bottom line. And third party, as we get new vendors, new things that are already prepackaged up, we have the same way of then shipping those using our current stack, which right now is Alassian, so we are Alassian stack. But we implement the same way we would any other type of SDLC into the DTR because it's all API driven. So that way we feel like from a developer, they're just using the same tools, the same processes, the same change management, all that that we've always had before. It enables though, then the automated CI CD pipeline to come online when we want to start deploying really, really fast. Then we finally get to the run state. We get the policy driven promotion with Docker. And that's a powerful thing for an enterprise of our nature to have. We want to take these containers, scan them, secure them, and then start talking about a normalized way for promotion between them. I want to promote this to dev. Well, does it, and then when it earns the dev badge, someone has the rights, our back, to put that on there, moves to int, the rights to, and goes to QA. It's the same container, it's just earning that ability to move up the stack. And that policy we can control, we can define. And now I'm really excited in the fact that we can involve both orchestrators. So we have the ability now, and I always brand this internally of shipping lanes. So I have a build, ship, and run, and I'm able to run with shipping lanes to a kube-activated CAS, um, a kube-activated CAS in Azure versus AWS, or Azure Stack, or on-prem IaaS. I can choose inside of Docker how we do this now, integrated. I'm extremely I'm thrilled with the announcements that came out today from, from all the guys, Solomon and everyone on the Docker team. So a little bit about our current regional projects. Um, based off of the work that we have done, there's the Liberty Server Container MTA program that we did. It is helping us understand how we're going to pay for the CAS implementation in 2018 with some business models. That CAS implementation will then house our big data API microservices that will come online in Q1. We're then understanding how we can pay for those with a mass conversion of these Liberty workloads as we go in and start really realizing that, that return on investment story that we've created. And then we'll start talking about big data workloads, thinking about how we can empower our science team and analytics. All of this is a roadmap that we can map out because we can understand how we're going to pay for it a, a, a lot more better. I mean, a lot, it, it makes sense to us now. And here's our total MetLife container journey. In 2017, we're really focused on quality and value, meaning that we want to integrate this into the development community. So we're tightly integrating this to the development tool stack all the way down to the developer, as in we are trying to understand exactly how our developers are developing. We want to give them a common makeup, a stack, that they can download, run, Vagrant, um, bringing in a Docker, bringing in a Compose or Kube so that they have the ability to say, I can, I can replicate a dev environment locally and start development and I can do remote debugging without having to, the, the problems of a normal container or, uh, infrastructure where we have containers sprawled across a 300 node development environment. And that didn't really resonate with our developers. So we're going to do something different and try to make it tightly coupled to what really resonates to them, how they want to develop on their time. From that, we'll also identify technology roadmaps, 
and the objectives to the end of this year is that CAS reference architecture, we'll build that out, implement that globally um, by publishing it. Then we'll start rolling that implementation out across the globe, focused on the US first, and then DevTools integration will complete that story to map us up to 2018 where we start actually delivering on some of these returns on investment by looking at the Java container migration, that Liberty server, data management analytics, that big data, and then big data as a service. And eventually we'll target ASP.NET later in the year to start doing a, a similar MTA upshift to figure out exactly how we could do that. So again, these patterns for success, we see them resonating with everything that we do with the container strategy. And it's really about being pragmatic with the approach of not boiling the ocean. But start small, believe me, it'll get just organically bigger. And you want it to get bigger because that really kind of tells you that you're doing it right and you're going to get it right. So start small and you'll be able to focus on all these, these details. I wouldn't try to do an entire data center, for instance. Select the right application candidate, one that you can extrapolate, one that you can expand linearly across your application portfolio. Create a strategy team, someone that's going to just focus on strategy, meaning what containers can do, what containers should do, how we're going to do those, and less about implementation. Leave the implementation up as a training exercise to those other, oper or those other operators. So leverage existing operations, change management. That's going to take time to integrate in, and they need to be the people that's going to operate it. And then innovate. You'll be able to innovate a whole lot more consistently. People will understand. You'll start talking about things in, in container terms, about deployments and rollbacks. That's a really, really good thing, and we're starting to see that more and more around the fact that people are interested in wanting to talk in a CI, CD as they are infrastructure engineers. That's, that's, that's a, that's, that lets me know that it's working. So if you'd like to hear more about this entire ecosystem, what we've done, how we're changing, where we're going. Tim Tyler is giving a talk on transformation, and I want you guys to, to head over there. And what that really is about is the ability for us to understand what is required from a transformation of mindset view to do something that's radical inside of an enterprise. And then my talk is to take really that ROI. How do we really realize the economics of it? What do we do inside as we treat IT as a business and understand how it's going to better our policyholders, our customers, and yours uh, whenever you start taking that on. So please go uh, see Tim Tyler's talk. And with that, that's my talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I, I, I actually prefer it. So if you guys would like to interact, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I also have, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, but also I've got a hallway group chat that if you want to talk face to face, maybe more private, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. And let me know if you have any questions and if you want to talk about anything, okay? Yeah, just a, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, there's three microphones kind of spread out here throughout the room, so make sure you ask your question in the microphone. Hey, yeah. Hi, Jeff. Um, so you talked about the, the applications that you chose and the, sort of where, where to start. Um, do you have a sense for how much of your state you'll be able to containerize? Are there certain applications that you'll never be able to containerize? Are there some things that will just always live on dedicated hardware or that there's just better just virtualized rather than containerized? I'd like to get you, you know, hear, what, hear where you think you are on that journey yeah. and how much is to go. No, that's a good question. Um, so if we, it really is going to be a technology specific answer. Uh, there are technologies, there's bad practices everywhere. Let's just go ahead and call up what it is. Uh, some developers target different APIs that might be server based APIs, so it makes it harder. Um, to, to, to move them onto a normalized stack. For instance, the WebSphere story. If they were doing something at an API level for WebSphere and not a Java level, well then there's got to be some type of translation there. Most of the time that can happen with an upgrade to a, an existing WebSphere and then cut over, but I've already got very specific about the application. So to answer the question of specifically, we think 70% can be containerized. Yeah, by taking stock. And what we're able to do then is more of a code management review the code, how many people are taking advantage of the things they shouldn't be, and target those and saying, well, they've got different problems and we'll have to care and feed them differently, but we can't, you can't do them just yet. So we're, it's usually about a 70-30 split, and that's been our experience, yeah. Any other parts of your question I didn't answer? Okay, all right, yeah. Uh, 
No. As someone who's relatively new to Docker, but not a new developer. Everyone's new to Docker, I well, think, right? Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Uh, but I am a developer for a living and yeah. new to Docker. The problem is, is that I see is you're talking about the business proposition of converting these legacy apps, but the, one of the very key things that you said, and, and I, I know it would be a huge hobgoblin, is avoid state. The problem is most legacy apps have state management, have session management. Have you and your group encountered and conquered that demon yet in any of the apps you've converted? Um, and if so, how? Yes, we have. And what we've, we've, we've done, especially with the, the session stuff, we're targeting building up session state management on um, reusable services. So we're targeting building a Redis service that's enterprise scalable. As opposed to, we, we did with GSSP build Redis containers inside of there. And we found that it's probably not the best use of containers um, it, for, from our use case. So, yeah, we have. And so coupled with some of these projects that will go on to uh, manage that, well, we, we, we found that probably it's 50-50 people managing sessions. Uh, and, and that's just the, how long have we gone back and saying that don't put sessions there, don't put sessions there for years, but it's easy. So it happens. So that memory stays there. So, um, but... Redis has been an option and it's been an enterprise session cache that we've looked at. We've also talked about separate transactional caches built in Mongo, but um, yeah, it's a problem and it's one that, that we, we've tried to push out to say, well, here's a, here's a session state management, target that and that way it enables you, it reduces that barrier to entry. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, hey. Your business case was presented as being based around consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, were there any other aspects, such as quality and l lowering incidents? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing I, I kind of glossed over, we did this without any service impact as far as the 70% reduction or 66% reduction. We wrap most of our ORI stuff around a service management. And included inside of that is the operational workloads as well. So it was a, it was a view of understanding um, how much of the reduction of uh, operations overhead would be assuming that we would have a better stability forecast. Um, but we, as a give and take, we don't want to oversell it, but we don't want to undersell it either. So yes, and I, I, they, play, they take that into account inside of the program as well. They'll break ORI into the, the, the key metrics of it, including stabilization, operations, headcount type of, of models. So yeah, it's a holistic view. And uh, can I ask what happened to your incident rate for these apps? Uh, well, um, it's a f so so far we you know we haven't done we haven't realized the liberty save yet on that so that's that's unchanged. But from GSSP perspective, it's taking on applications as it goes, and we're seeing roughly around a twenty percent reduction in incident cases. So what that what that's telling us is it's working. We don't have a, a good portfolio yet as we take on those pragmatically, but. The other side of it is operations is learning. The way that we implemented GSSP is not the way we probably would do it now. Um, but it was done and, and operations is getting better and better. So we're seeing that, there's op that, that they're able to respond quicker. We're able to automate things better. So it's, it's, it's kind of not baked yet. But yeah, 20% reduction. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hey. I'm happy to see this particular case with Web Series and Liberty because I, me, myself, I face a similar challenge in Brazil in Central Bank. So I'd like to note if he, how vital it was for, for having upper management support or operation team support for this change, and if you actually had any support from IBM itself. Um, we're getting there with IBM. Um, I, uh, so with IBM right now, where we are is trying to figure out the licensing story. They haven't quite figured out the licensing story for um, Liberty Server Container either. But there is the open source option, right? But we're not divorcing that from reality with our ORI models. We're assuming it's going to be relatively the same as WebSphere as far as the licensing goes. Um, with that, we're still full steam ahead as far as implementation goes and targeting that, that same Q1 um, implementation date. Now, going back to your first question, um, with operations now, understanding that GSSP, that, that, that disruptive one, was hard for them, we've modified how we build things with them. And so we've included them in a different track in the fact that right now we're building out standard operating procedures in extremely lab environments and handing them over so that they build from developer impact the next generation of those environments. So that goes back to that strategy team concept of let's step back. All right, let's engineer and then let operations actually build everything else out um, to try to create that organic growth. So we fundamentally are tackling it with, hey, we're, we're going to, 
we're going to build a strategy and we're going to watch you build it. We might be over your shoulder, but you're going to actually do it. So that, that helps enforce operations kind of um, learning as they go. And it's tough because they have a day job. You know, right? I mean, they're, they're looking at um, the production outages. As a, where we did before, we sat down with a three-week training and we, everyone would come like a lunch and learn situation for half a day to learn Docker and realize that no one was showing up. <laughs> and it wasn't because they didn't want to learn. They don't have time. Yeah. So we integrate them into the implementation project. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I, I'd like to ask about the human factor of uh, performing the rising. You partially uh, answered this question, uh, but uh, I'd like to ask how to encourage the teams to even start thinking about the decreasing its application because you know it's working for years. Leave my application as is. I don't want to. How do you encourage them? Do you force him to do? Do you choose the application and told your application has been chosen? You need to cooperate. <laughs> Uh, how do you done that? I would love to choose them and force them. Man, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> that I mean, uh, developers, right? Uh, but um, no. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question, and I think the the way to respond back is the is through value, really. Um, They'll see the value behind it, uh, and, we, 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 and what we've tried to focus to increase that value from the infrastructure team is that we're, um, we've actually uh, quasi-employed a developer from our other line of business. What we've, we've done is integrate them into our team as an as a, as a external member, but he's focused on um, creating a developer tools image. So basically, the center of excellence around how to get started. It's not always easy for the thousands of developers we have around the globe to get a, into a center of excellence. But if we create internally like an open source project that says, hey, just download this and you can use th this uh, vagrant file or this vagrant file to build out a GSSP image locally and start playing around with it. And if we normalize that to say, well, now it's just for, for Liberty and it's a Hello World app. So all you have to do to modify this is to take your jar file, stick it here and run this command and then let it come up. So it's, a, it's really a, it's about value and, and showing that back over to the developer to get them started. Now, that's the developer story. Then let's talk about the product manager story, right? They're already trying to think of ways to try to run down their costs. So the value, it kind of meets in the middle there. But we don't, we're not going to force it. We are going to fund it probably and then say, why would you not do this, right? So it will be more of a, a value proposition as opposed to a forcing. And by then, hopefully, we'll have a turnkey solution for them to be able to say, oh, this is how I do that? Okay, all right. That's good Otherwise, they're going to have to maintain WebSphere 6. whatever, right? So it's... The value will be there, yeah, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Thanks for your yeah. answer. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, once uh, an application is migrated, what's, uh, what's the percentage that goes public and stays uh, private in the cloud? In and the cloud. How do you make that decision? Uh, well, so we, right now at MetLife, we've ha we, have a pro we have an Azure subscription that's not, we're not using any public passes. So um, we'll put IaaS in the cloud. And I, I think what you're asking is what, what workloads do we put in that cloud, that type of cloud, right? Not public paths or interfaces, right? And what remains within your data center? Yep. I think everyone's challenging right now that whole concept. Where, what data and what data should live where? Data is really the driver behind it. Uh, is it HIPAA data? Is it PII data? Different countries have different answers to that question. Um, so for us, it's a case by case. Primarily from EI perspective, what we want to build is on-prem or the cloud, and we can capability-wise that. Architecture's got an architecture assessment they do to figure out whether or not we should deploy it here versus there. And the developer, it, it doesn't change. The tool stack should be able to talk to both. Yes, sir. Oh, I think it's time. Yeah. I can yeah. catch up with you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.